Welcome to the Getting Started in Telemedicine webinar series. Today is the final series. You can't see me, but my name is Anne, and I just want to go over a few housekeeping things. So we do have the slides for the presentations in the handout section, which should be somewhere near your questions panel. And in your questions box, that's where you should submit your questions, and we'll try to get to them during the Q&A. This session will be recorded, and you'll receive access to it in a couple days after this webinar. And we also have the web past webinars in this series, so malpractice, um, telemedicine reimbursement, and um, some other good stuff. You can go to those and see them on demand at vc.com slash webinars. Um, and let me go ahead and take a quick poll, see if everyone is hearing okay. Maybe I should have started with that. So if you can raise your hand, um, if you're hearing, Okay, great. Thank you, Anthony, Irv, Jennifer. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll go ahead and pass the time to Dr. Goldman. Thank you, Anne. So everybody, welcome to uh, today's webinar sponsored by the Alameda Contra, Me Contra Costa Medical Association in association with Global Health Impact Network and VC. This webinar series is being made available to multiple Bay Area medical associations across the Bay Area. Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Goldman. I'm a council member for the ACCMA. I've also been a practicing anesthesiologist at Alta Bates Summit Medical Center in the East Bay, uh, which is a Sutter Health affiliate uh, since 1989. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur in the digital healthcare space. Uh, I've been involved in companies related to continuing education, international nursing, staffing, and a cloud-based health provider uh, data management and credentialing solution. I'm currently and have been for the last eight years a Sutter Health Physician Informatics Lead for EHR development, uh, overseeing implementation through optimization for anesthesia and perioperative services. And I'm currently the founder and CEO of Global Health Impact Network, which is a clinician-driven collaborative network of clinical and digital health communities focused in the ecosystem of digital health innovation. Uh, our vision is, and we feel it's imperative that clinicians play an active role in what we believe is the precipice of the digital healthcare revolution. Let's talk a little bit about the ACCMA. It's a professional association of physicians who are committed to addressing health issues of concern to patients and doctors in the East Bay. We provide a forum for physicians to come together to improve public health, the quality of the practice of medicine, and patients' access to care. This event is just one example of among hundreds of activities that the ACCMA engages in every year to help physicians. These activities include political and public, public advoc policy advocacy, things like holding local meetings with elect elected officials on healthcare legislation, regulatory compliance, things like ensuring network adequacy for covered California plans and helping members comply with Medicare reporting programs, and practice management assistance. Assistance, things like the, uh, presenting ongoing seminars and webinars uh, such as this, this one related to practice. Uh, this webinar, which is the last in the series of six of getting started in telemedicine. Um, next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Yuli Chetapali. Uh, Yuli is a physician, researcher, author, and innovator. He's currently the president of Innovator MD a healthcare innovation company. As a physician scientist, he's interested in technology-enabled care. He's previously received the Pioneer Award for Innovation from Kaiser Permanente and the Morris F. Collin Research Award from the Permanente Medical Group. His other roles include he's president-elect currently for the San Mateo County Medical Association. He's currently chairman of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter. He acts as an advisor, mentor, and investor at various healthcare startups, and he's the author of Punish the Machine, The Promise of Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare, and uh, Yuli will be hosting uh, the seminar. Take it away, Yuli. Thank you, Gary. Um, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, welcome, listeners. Uh, today, we have an exciting program. We have uh, two real-life practicing emergency physicians, I'm sorry, practitioners of uh, telemedicine. And so you will hear some great uh, information from them and some pearls, some do's and don'ts, um, a lot of exciting stuff today. So uh, let me first uh, introduce to you our first speaker. It is 
Richard E. Thorp, MD. He is the president and CEO of Paradise Medical Group, a primary care group in Northern California. Paradise began to offer virtual care services after a deadly California fire in the fall of 2018 that destroyed PMG's main clinic building. As part of the financial and in-kind support from Blue Shield of California, PMG's virtual care platform was built to provide access to its now dispersed patients. Please welcome uh, Richard Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe, it's all yours. Thank you, Yuli, and uh, thanks to ACCMA for inviting me to be part of the of the uh, presentation today. Um, it's a real honor to be uh, part of ACCMA. I, I have uh, some personal affection for the organization and have uh, a great fondness for for the work that you guys do. Um, so, uh, can let's see, can you see my screen? So we're seeing. Um, we're not seeing. There it is. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I I'm a late comer to uh, to telemedicine uh, specifically, um, and honestly, we were really forced into being uh, telehealth providers because of the situation. Um, our uh, you, you know previous prior to November eight, twenty eighteen, we were a traditional uh, independent primary care medical group doing the usual things that most people do. Uh, seeing patients in the office, uh, uh, managing hospital patients, managing clinic patients uh, day to day. Um, that day basically destroyed the entire infrastructure for our community in healthcare. Uh, not to mention the fact that it um, it uh, was the deadliest wildfire in recorded history um, period. So we were forced into recovery mode very quickly. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about just a few things about how we actually recovered and tried to rebuild our practice to help support the community that was now widely dispersed, um, how we started working on virtual care uh, on the ground and trying to get paid for it, uh, which is an interesting challenge, uh, back in 2018. Um, uh, we did have a health plan come uh, alongside and be very helpful to us to, to help us establish these things. And it was a really a coordinated plan with the healthcare and the medical group, with the health plan and the medical group to provide care, not just for the patients of that particular plan, but they provided us with the ability to, to give that same care to every patient, regardless of payer. Um, and then how do we scale that going forward? Um, obviously, the, um, the ability to, to rotate quickly with the COVID-19 uh, challenge how we always have the infrastructure in place so today we're going to try to try and understand what we what I feel like are the keys to understanding and sustaining a virtual care platform discussing some of the tools that we use to successfully deploy these models and recognize um, how we can uh, make this work going further forward just to detail a little bit of what happened that day um, 85 people died um, 15,000 homes were destroyed in a community of about 25,000 people, so obviously more than one person per home. Um, our community, including our medical community, was completely de devastated and scattered all over the state, basically. Um, uh, subsequently, there was no, you know, initially, there was nothing open. We had no, uh, the clinic was closed. Part of our clinic had been destroyed by the fire. The hospital was closed and all facilities in town were under National Guard uh, lockdown, basically. Eventually, over the next several months, two, two medical facilities, our medical facility at Paradise Medical Group and a rural health clinic uh, affiliated with Feather River Hospital were opened back up again. But again, very limited ability to take care of people who were widely dispersed um, across the state and sometimes across the country. Just to show you that there's a challenge here, um, even though very quickly within a couple of weeks, we started working with our health plan to try to provide a solution. Um, we actually didn't get our clinic opened for about six months. We didn't actually uh, turn it on for our patients until May 28 of 2019. But at that point, um, again, we were able to offer it to all of our patients, including Medicare and any other payer uh, that was not specifically 
um, a, a client, I mean, a, that the patients weren't specifically a client of that individual payer. Um, it was, you know, a broad spectrum of care that uh, emphasized the ability to personalize uh, each individual's uh, personal ability to use a platform. And I'm going to emphasize that a little bit later in the talk. I think it's really important as we develop these products that we be aware that the patient or the client many times is not very sophisticated about the way they use their their platform and it takes it took us anyway in our situation a fair amount of work to get that to work properly um, it did allow us to reach patients as far as well all throughout california um, obviously there's a licensing issue so if you're going to be providing care to someone who is a permanent resident in another state that is not uh, currently accounted for, although there may be some exceptions being made currently because of the COVID-19 virus. Um, as you can see, our, our adoption wasn't really dramatic initially. Uh, we did have um, uh, some consistent adoption between May and December of 2019, but a total of 240 visits between May and, and December. So uh, I have to say, I probably was the main user of the product at that point and was varying between four to six patients a day um, seeing them. As you can imagine, the challenge, especially with uh, when Medicare wasn't paying for this back at, at that time, um, is how do you make it financially viable? And how do you make sure that uh, you still maintain the ability to see patients in the office and still schedule virtual visits? Between May and December, we had 506 total registrations um, but from March to April, March 1 to April 23rd, our total visits dramatically increased, which just shows we were pivoting on the COVID-19 crisis from uh, 540 registered between uh, uh, May of 2019 and December of 2019 to 1,007 in the last uh, five weeks, basically. Or well, it's actually a little more than that, I guess, May, March 1 to April 23rd. Um, so <clears throat> I think now, I mean, the question is how do you, you know, cause we had a, we had the system in place and we were able to just uh, rotate kind of turn and, and, and accept this challenge. And we basically transferred all of our scheduled visits to virtual visits, um, overnight. And, um, as you know, that there's some issues with choosing a vendor. I think the, the currently acceptable to CMS anyway, even though some of them are, non, are not HIPAA compliant, we're, are FaceTime and Skype, those are the two HIPAA non-compliant, at least at this point to my knowledge, they're still non-compliant. The HIPAA compliant, HIPAA compliant uh, platforms were Teladoc, DoxyMe, Zoom for Healthcare, and there may be others that I'm not aware of. Those are the, those are the ones that I know about. Um, and I think when you're choosing a vendor, it's important to keep it, as I said before, keep it simple for the patient. You know, some of them are using an Android, some of them are using an iPhone, some of them are using an Android tablet or an iPad, some are using a, 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 a PC, some of them are using a Mac. And so it's really important that we dumb it down or at least make it accessible for every patient so that it, they can do it easily. Um, and so in choosing a vendor that can be versatile and as simple to use as possible on any of those platforms. I think is really, uh, at least we found that to be a key. Um, in our enrollment process, we basically, because we already had the platform in place and we already had a process in place for doing it, including having the link to the, uh, to the app for the phone on our website, we were able to convert our current appointments to a virtual visit. And so for instance, Today, we're calling our patients scheduled for Monday and converting all of those patients to um, a virtual visit. We register them in our system, whatever is necessary. Some systems require more registration than others, but we register them and do a test visit today so that we check and make sure that their camera works, that make sure that they can be heard, make sure that they can hear you. And we have found that it's not really, um, um, it, it doesn't work, work very well if we expect them to be able to navigate through the, the prompts on the system on their own. There's a lot of little intricacies here and there for some systems 
that make it more difficult for them to navigate on their own. So we we walk them through it step by step to make sure that they are ready to go. So then on Monday, when they come in for their appointment, our medical assistant will call them, get them set up again. Virtually, they room the patient, making sure the regular MA questions are asked, ensuring that the patient is ready for the provider. And we schedule right now every 20 minutes. So the, the provider is just a full schedule. We're seeing 90% of our regular schedule today. And um, and and that limits the amount of downtime that the that the clinician has to deal with, so that they can still be productive and still uh, perform the role that they need to perform. I mean, you don't need a natural disaster um, to to make this work, but I mean, it seems like it helps, right? Uh, the uh, we would not have done this if it had not been for the campfire, and I can tell you our adoption rate would have been still minimal had it not been for the COVID-19 pandemic precautions. Uh, we think telehealth is just at the beginning. Someone referred to it as a precipice, and I believe that's probably true. Uh, we think there are a number of tools being, being developed. We believe it has a larger role to play in the future. And I really think that as we've made this transition, patients really like this idea of being able to wait at home in their, in their own, quote, waiting room and not have to wait in your waiting room. Um, so I think we're gonna see, at least in our community and in our patient population, I think we're gonna see a significant increase in the request for adoption of this, of this uh, platform. So currently we're using this as our scheduling for regular patients. We are not using it yet for, uh, I mean, if we have somebody call in and need to be seen, we will see them. We don't just have a platform wide open so people can show up whenever they want to. And I'd be happy to, anyway, I think we're gonna, I'll turn it back to Yuli at that point, at this point. Thank you very much, Dick. Uh, that was a, a nice presentation. Um, uh, you know, we've heard about uh, paradise, but uh, now we actually see how devastating uh, that, uh, fire was. Yeah. And uh, next, uh, we go to uh, our next presenter. It is Mark Dean. Mark Dean, MD, is the co-founder and chairman of uh, Vitruvio Institute of Medical Advancement, also known as VIMA. Dr. Dean has dedicated his life to solving healthcare problems through innovative technology and breakthrough techniques. He has been a lead researcher in clinical trials for a number of new devices, as well as in the development of new procedures in the ENT community. Dr. Dean's use of advanced telemedicine technologies has also allowed him to make an impact at a global scale, which with the humanitarian outreach program in both Latin America and the Middle East, including multiple trips to Iraq. Please welcome Dr. Mark Dean. Hello, how are you guys doing? And, and thank you again for the uh, invitation. So I, similar to Dr. Thorpe, um, my entire kind of introduction to telehealth also came about from a natural disaster and it was Katrina during residency and, and we were exposed in New Orleans to um, basically the only way to see a lot of our patients was through telehealth. and I began using it in my own practice once I graduated in 2010. And there is obviously, we'll get into a second, uh, a lot of barriers into getting into telehealth in a normal environment. And one of my, as Julie kind of alluded to, I, I've helped innovate several new procedures as well as devices. And, and one of the hardest things to get physicians to change is changing what they do. They're, they like comfort. They like to know how to do it. And if you end up having a new way of doing things, it becomes the the impetus for change needs to be very strong or the the change needs to be very small. And in telehealth, there's just such a huge change, especially when it comes to the physical exam, that most people don't want to even begin to approach it. Um, interestingly, most people, um, and we'll talk today, here's just my objectives for CME. Um, Credit. Most people 
um, have been, at least until January, the entire world was really up here at this, uh, the very beginning of telemedicine, despite the fact that it's really been being practiced for over 50 years. Um, on one of my trips to Iraq, where we were establishing a, a telehealth fellowship, um, we had a one of the, I guess you could say, most well-known fellowship directors in ENT, and he uh, described having a, he was using telehealth in 1968, using fax machines to send things back and forth. So certain technologies have been uh, around for a while. And so as, as we begin to look about how slow, what has it been since we even began to get there? And, and this is really it. This has been up until obviously COVID, the current state of mind has been that, yeah, we love using technology, but we are, we have 98% of us want to see everybody inpatient because it's work. We know how it, uh, how it responds. We have plenty of patients coming in. There's no real impetus to change. And, and so interestingly, and to Dr. Thorpe's comment earlier, patients actually love this. They've, they've actually shown that most patients would prefer telehealth. It's actually the doctors that don't. Um, and a lot of us is we just, you know, this, uh, the AMA even said that it was snake oil three years ago. Um, so this is actually done based off a uh, World Health Organization evaluation of telehealth and what were the major barriers in, uh, this was actually published in 2017, but really hasn't changed. The biggest one is regulatory. And luckily with COVID, because this natural disaster happened on a um, international scale, we've been able to get past most of the regulatory uh, issues at this point. I will warn everyone there will be some of this will come back, probably not to the degree it was, but I do think that, that we'll have to keep an eye on what this evolves once this goes on long-term. Financial, um, usually it was setting up a program. And interestingly, it's also become the impetus right now for being able to provide telemedicine. And then lastly, cultural biases are either between the fish and patients, whether or not it would be good medicine or not. Um, having said that, the advantages of telemedicine really outweigh a lot of the risks. It's a, uh, the access to care, quality of care. Most randomized controlled studies show telemedicine provides a higher quality of care even than um, in physician visits, despite the fact that physicians actually rank the telemedicine visits less uh, efficient or less uh, of quality. Um, and then cost efficiency. Once you've actually set up the system, your overhead becomes a lot less. So this is uh, from also another article looking at um, World Health Organization's uh, um, integration of telehealth. The, the top five things to really integrate into your practice are really to focus on collaboration and per uh, participation capacity building. Well, right now, everybody's collaborating. You're not getting any kind of, of resistance. So now is the time to begin to lay the found foundation for what you want to build in the future. Um, working with other physicians, telehealth programs, insurances to really collaborate, and how can we provide care to physicians? Um, be aware of the local laws. Right now, there are very few. Licensure is, is definitely one of them. Certain states are uh, allowing emergency licensure just automatically, something you have to apply for. But you do have to make sure uh, you, are, you are considered to be practicing medicine where the patient is, not where the physician is. So you do need to make sure that you are licensed in that state, um, either emergently or um, through some sort of uh, agreement. Um, Low-cost evaluation solution. Um, most of the things I'll show you here in a second um, are not very expensive. Telehealth can be done without a lot of fancy equipment. Um, you need to not change what you do. Documentation, analysis, all the things that you would do in your normal practice, EMRs, it, you need to continue to do. Um, I've always taught that, it, in at least especially in my practice, I didn't want to, to change my workflow or make it different. I just wanted to make it to be able to plug in telemedicine when I needed to. And then the social benefits of telemedicine, um, especially right now, a lot of my patients, because they are cloistered and in quarantine, especially the Medicare patients, they love being able to do telehealth visits because it, it's a social interaction for them. It's a, the ability for them to get out, move on. Um, 
Now, looking at telehealth, there's a lot of ways to implement this into your practice. You've got telemedicine, which is, is really the practice of medicine, the clinical interaction between the provider and the patient. But you also have um, both what they are now calling telecare and e-health, but these are all um, separate, either remote monitoring, digital evaluations, um, phone calls, a lot of things that don't involve um, telemedicine uh, or clinical decision-making. Um, and the reason this is important is there are really three, I'm not going to get into the details of coding because I think there's already a webinar on that, but there are three types of, of CPT codes for um, telehealth, and each one addresses the, those three categories. So you've got the, the traditional visits, you have the telephone evaluation and management, and you also have the online digital visits. And to Dr. Thorpe's uh, comment about sustainability, you know, this is one of the ways I have been able to, to help telemedicine help sustain my practice, um, especially as being a surgeon going to a, a telehealth platform. Similar to, to um, the Dr. Thorpe's program, I actually, instead of the day before, we actually, once COVID, we had made the decision to go switch over 100% to telehealth. What we did was we went to... Um, the, we, we called all of the patients, which we were able to bill for, um, and we then passed them, as it got about a week to two weeks before their visit, we sent them an online digital surveys based off validated symptom scores where they were able to um, digitally enter in all of their, their symptom scores and everything else. We were able to evaluate them and decide whether they needed to come in or not. If all of them were within normal range, they, we rescheduled the visit for eight to 12 weeks out. If they were able, if they weren't doing as well as expected, then we were able to um, bring them in either sooner or um, set up a webcam view and do telehealth. And that actually has a CPT code that is reimbursed, um, obviously significantly more than the telephone. Um, and then looking at the telehealth visits, you'll notice it's not a different E&M code. It's the same one. Um, there has been a lot of changes on site of service and others, but essentially you have to provide the same level of care as you did before. The billing rules still apply. So this is an, an example, um, just because that's what I'm most familiar with. But if you look up here in the upper left corner, you know, the only part that is a little bit difficult to do on a televisit or um, telemedicine is a physical exam, and especially for documentation. And, um, you know, to build a level four visit, if you're in a subspecialty, you need 12 of uh, elements total um, in two different categories, or you, you can do nine, uh, two elements in nine categories for a level four new patient. You'll notice on, these are the bullets that CMS recognizes or, or suggests using. Some of these do require palpation or visualization like of the eardrum or others, but I can inspect the lip, teeth, and gums from, from just looking at the face, just having smile. I can look at the um, external expression of the ears and the nose. That's two bullets right there. You've got the, you can have them open their mouth. You can have them uh, look at their mucosa, their lips. Um, I can look at nick masses and you just document video exam or, uh, on video evaluation, uh, no significant mass is noted, um, no thyroid mass visualized, CP uh, looks good, um, eyes uh, reactive, pupil pupils normal. You can actually easily get 12 points. So you can get that level four visit that you, you were used to. And then as you begin familiar again i've been doing this for 10 years so i was a little bit more ready to pivot but there are some really good types of devices at home depending on your type of practice your um your your diagnostic needs whether or not it even matters to to use or not so for example i a large number of my patients um i've either operated on or am planning to operate on and so what we would do is i would send a uh, before the visit, we will tell them, give them a link, and there's multiple ones on Amazon. You just type in endoscope, otoscope, uh, USB, and you'll get a huge list of uh, different versions of these endoscopes that they can. I can direct them through a full endoscopic exam 
They can place it in their ear, their nose. I can visualize what I need to. And so I'm actually doing as, as good as or better exam because I'm getting now HD quality video. Um, I bet for a lot of those that just use an otoscope, this HD picture on the screen is probably significantly better than what you see with your otoscope. Um, for those, I don't do a lot of uh, auscultation, uh, even in my normal practice, um, or obviously any kind of imaging, but other solutions for when we're doing either pre-ops or in uh, other areas is you can get these cheap stethoscopes that you can actually, patients can purchase, to have them sent to their house. These all can be purchased online. All of them are within a reasonable amount. I would say that the cameras I've seen are anywhere between $9 and 30 these stethoscopes anywhere between 40 and 100 and something. Um, these EKGs, a six lead EKG that can be sent home. It's a, um, it's a, it's around a hundred and some dollars. And the, uh, the altar sounds a little bit more pricey, obviously, but it's a thousand. But compared to what you would get a, a traditional ultrasound, it's significantly less. And if you need to do serial exams, like let's say this is an OB patient, you need to do a lot of just well checks. Um, the uh, investing in a, a ultrasound may make sense, especially if you're from a long distance away, you can't get into the physician's office. And there are algorithms that we've worked with. Um, one of the projects I, I got, I was had the good fortune to work on was um, doing some remote, like basically a, a, we had a conference on how to figure out to practice medicine on the mission to Mars or colonizing the moon and how do you provide medical care and one of the things that the astronauts to do, today do for their evaluations up there, since they can't do physical exams, is that they do their own ultrasounds. Um, and there are, you use cardinal directions. So instead of telling them anterior, posterior, or anything like that, you'll say north, south, uh, left, right, um, or east, west, depending on what you establish as north. And they're able to follow that and give you a, a pretty decent exam. And you can share that images. So you can, as you begin to integrate this more and more into your practice, um, some people will, will probably convert a significant amount over, others won't. Um, my practice is in Texas, so I have a lot of rural health that, that would prefer telehealth because just the cost of gas coming to see me is, is enough to purchase one of these instruments. Um, and so the thing to remember is if you build it, and this uh, little character up here is a, a a survey result of when people ask what they wanted, um, both for EMRs, telehealth, or any kind of um, electronic solution, it is the majority, over 80%, it's always help deliver care to, it, it care to patients. And that's what drives all of us. It's not the fancy stuff. It's not the billing. It's You just need a way to see your patient and, and create an exam. It's just going to be like the switch over from laparoscopic or for open col uh, colies to laparoscopic colies. You know, we're still doing the same thing. We're taking out the gallbladder. But the order we do it in, the steps you do, the, th the, the visualization, all of the, the tools you use are all completely different. Um, and so it's going to be the, a similar transition um, I think now. And I, do, I think that it will always be incorporated to some degree depending on, on what it's going to be, depending on the regulatory environment afterwards. But these are really the things. You want it to, to work with your traditional workflow. You don't want to have to, uh, as little as you can change, work on I have my MA register. I'm like normal. My front desk check them in like normal. Um, it's for me, instead of walking into a room, I'm just walking into my office and turning on the TV but, or the, the computer screen, but it's not any, otherwise the workflows aren't any different. Um, if I have to do cultures or anything like that, I send them out to the patient and they mail them in. Um, you can really do a complete diagnostic evaluation and investing in some of those um, equipments or doing research into them is going to be important. And, and it allows you to provide treatment in areas you wouldn't have before. Um, things that you really want to watch out for is um, trying to get one that, that I don't even have mine interact with my EHR. Sometimes that actually slows you down, becomes a bandwidth problem. Um, I, I have my, I actually use a scry, uh, virtual scribe that listens in and types up the notes myself. So I don't have to, to do that at all, but you could also use your EHR separately while you have this pulled up. Um, and then again, the payment and regulatory compliance, since that's pretty much been turned on its head, we'll see where that ends up.
Um, and electronic communication. I think we all saw over the last six weeks um, good days and bad days with telehealth. Um, a large part of that is because of the bandwidth and and the companies have been desperately trying to increase uh, server capacity. And, and as that becomes kind of built in, it'll be less and less of a problem. And then I'm just going to kind of leave with the quote um, from uh, Dr. Peabody, which I think applies to everything that we do, is the treatment of disease must be completely impersonal. The treatment of the patient must be completely personal. Um, digital health actually lets us reach out into their homes. I mean, the thing that, that is different about this kind of telehealth, and I think even to Dr. Thorpe will, will agree, is that the old regulations required usually patients to go to a clinical or similar facility. So it, we weren't seeing inside their homes. We were seeing in, in places where they could get maybe a lower level of care, but still somewhat medical or clinical. Now you actually look into their homes, you see them, have their kids playing around, the environments are different. So you do, you become even more personal, I think, with um, telehealth and it, it allows us to be better doctors. So with that, I will pass it back to Lily, Yuli and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we have some questions popping up on the screen here. Um, let me see. Well, this is uh, this question is for Dick. You know, when it comes to having the MA, you know, screen the patients and talk to the patients, how do you do that? How do you have the MA screen? Is that built into the uh, into the workflow? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we actually have our MA call the patient on the phone and um, number one, walk them through the process again, make sure that they're set up for their visit so that they're actually in the, I mean, the the the, the uh, platform that we use actually has a waiting room, so to speak. Um, and, but at the same time, she's asking that we, we actually do remote physiologic monitoring too. So we have blood pressure devices that we have distributed to all of our Medicare patients and um, they have the ability to check their blood pressure and pulse rate. So <clears throat> many of those have uh, the ability to take their own vital signs uh, prior to the visit. So we go through those, put them in uh, the EMR just like we would normally put them in. Any questions that they have about their, if they've had lab work done or if they, some of them haven't done now because of the COVID-19 stuff, but many of them have, and we go make sure that those are all in the chart, ready to go. and. Uh, and then any any additional concerns other than you know the routine follow-ups that we normally do for chronic disease, hypertension, coronary disease, hyperlipidemia, um, we address those issues, of course. But sometimes they've got you know a new shoulder pain or something like that. There are some things, obviously, you know, you can't you can't do you can't I can't I haven't figured out how to do an injection uh, uh, with telemedicine <laughs> yet. But uh, you know, there's but there's a lot you can do. And uh, we have, uh, and our MAs are, are are basically adopting this technology and patients, amazingly, uh, many of our Medicare patients really have come to really like this because as Mark was saying, you know, it's, it's uh, it does give them a, a different level of engagement than what they get when you just walk in, in the room and then walk out quickly and you don't really have a chance to engage with them in a real personal way. Great. Um, the next question is, you know, um, again for Richard, how do you connect it to your billing system? So we use a uh, so we use a separate platform for our um, telemedicine uh, product. It the one that we use actually has the ability to have an electronic health record and billing through it, but we have this. We just don't use that. We haven't electronic health record that we have chosen and that we have developed and so we basically create a note in our electronic health record just like we always would uh, we go ahead and put in the appropriate cpt coding that mark really did a great job of kind of pointing out the different varieties of ways that you can bill and we use all those sometimes we can't get a um a patient up and running on the on the video platform we just they just don't have the device to do it or they just are not technically capable of doing it 
And so on those, we convert them to just a phone call and we do it uh, and we bill them as a phone call. It's clearly not as good in terms of reimbursement, but it still works. And but but nonetheless, no matter which way we do it, we identify what kind of a visit it is and we go through, create the same subjective platform, same review of systems. What if we can do, a, uh, if it's a video visit, we do uh, the same kind of thing where we we document what we can see on the video and then we code it uh, appropriately and then we submit it as we normally do any other billing process. It is, I think, uh, it's important, Mark, I, I know you pointed this out, Dr. Dean, that that um, currently with CMS, if you're billing for a telehealth visit, you can bill the normal 99212, 99202 codes as long as you can document that you've, you you know, the, the, the appropriate uh, bullet points are there, but you do have to put a, a different site of service, so the G code that you have to insert to get it to actually be paid, it'll be paid the same amount, but you can't put this the site of service as your as your uh, office site of service. It's done with a G code, and I can't remember the G code, but maybe maybe Dr. Dean knows that. But but it's anyway, it's it's a little bit of a difference, but it's it's not uh, it's very easy to to make it work. The billing G codes and site of service have changed almost daily since this COVID. There for a while, they had the reason why you had to put site of service to some degrees. There was actually, if it was a clinic that they were being seen, they actually got a technology fee as well. So that was part of the differentiation of why you put like 11 versus a 2 versus the G modifiers um, if they were at home. So now that everything is being billed as a regular visit, there is a, um, it, they've actually gone back, at least the last I remember reading is that you're just using the same side of service you always have. Like you just bill out like it's normal. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Mark. Um, now you say that you can do physical exam, you know, through telemedicine. Um, and you expect the patient to purchase the medical devices, you know, to be able to do that exam. Well, what has been the reaction from patients? You know, are they happy? Are they, and then, plus I, I'm, I'm assuming that they will have to pay themselves out of pocket, right? Yeah, so, and I always give them a choice. It's even like surgery and everything else. I never tell them to have to do anything. Uh, what I usually explain to them is that I am limited to my ability to evaluate them through just a camera and that there are other cameras or other things that can we can use to do a better exam. Um, for example, the endoscopes, things like that. And the costs aren't very much. Um, I will tell you, I've gotten zero pushback from any of my patients. Um, in fact, one of the things that they like is they can actually see the images on the screen as well. So for the first time, they're actually seeing their eardrum or their tube or the site of surgery or their like we just did a I tried to actually put it in the video but it was just too much um, bandwidth um, you know I was a, I'm able to walk I had done a full basically uh, corrected a meningocephalocele in the brain and we were w uh, watching that um, pretty closely so she was one of those that I wasn't really excited that I couldn't see her in the clinic and we were able to have her direct the camera directly to her site of, of the surgery, make sure it was healing well. And she was really excited to be able to see it and do it, you know, understand where it was. And, and all of a sudden, it made more sense to her why I was caring about certain things versus not. So um, I think if they were, you know, an ultrasound, if I, I've never had a patient, for, I don't need that. But if I were going to have buy a thousand dollar ultrasound, I probably would get some pushback. But um, I, I think my first step would be just sending them to an imaging center um, and then having the looking at the images. But the uh, most of the um, to, if you think about it, how many devices do we really use in the office? You know, none. I mean, you, your eyes and your hands, maybe a stethoscope. Those are the only two things that if I have an endoscopic camera and a stethoscope, the only thing I'm not doing is palpating. and and there are going to be a few things that that we um, really need to feel if it's good or bad, but those can be evaluated by imaging. So 
I, I would say my threshold when I'm doing televisits to get a CT scan or an ultrasound is much lower. Um, but otherwise, it uh, it's not really that bad. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Richard, uh, our next question comes from Benelia. Uh, and Benelia asks, are you using it for new patients for first time visit? Yes, we do. Um, uh, obviously, this has been going on long enough that we have, so we're doing primary care. We're, uh, we do both adult and pediatric uh, primary care. And uh, both our pediatricians and our adult docs um, it's a little bit more of a challenge because typically we're used to doing a pretty complete physical exam, uh, but we're still doing the intake, we're still doing the same subjective history, still doing the same review of systems, still taking the same past history, the same, all, all of those things are still the same. A lot of them we are trying to pre-populate uh, electronically um, so that the review of systems, past medical history, surgical history, all those things, medication lists, all that. We're trying to pre-populate um, electronically before the visit, so I'm not sitting there spending, you know, all my time going through those details, but trying to make sure that they're clear, and then trying to clarify any issues that come up on the review systems or their primary problems. Um, so we're just spending time clarifying that. Um, we are, you know, we obviously, we plan to bring them back at some point to do um, the appropriate exams, uh, and, they, and there are many that need to be done. I'm sure you know you, you can understand what what I mean. But there, there's uh, there are some things you can do. I think uh, uh, Dr. Dean mentioned, of course, that they are um, there are auscultation capabilities, and um, I'm we are using a uh, in our practice we use ultrasound uh, bedside ultrasound, and so. Uh, there are some low, I mean, relatively low-cost options there, um, but we haven't used that. We haven't just we haven't uh, dispersed that for patient care. But I am interested in the EKG and and some of the other ideas that you, that uh, Dr. Dean mentioned because I we haven't. I don't think we've completely. We need to do some more investigation into those modalities because I think those are really exciting. So is that. Uh... Being able to see new patients is that a new relaxation of the regulation where the you know in the past they used to say, "Oh, you have to have a physician patient relationship before you actually do telemedicine mark is that a new thing or recent so thing? I think it depends on your state a little bit um again, this got into the licensing and regulation I think that made it so difficult to um you know i as I said I've been I've had the telehealth capacity since 2010, but it was probably only 1% of my practice until six weeks ago. Um, what changed was that every, I could see everyone the same. Um, I will tell you in Texas, our, our medical board says that you do a face-to-face -face visit is necessary to establish a uh, patient um, relationship, but that can be done with video. Um, a telephone um, conference is not uh, uh, sufficient. Yeah. So uh, you can you you can see new med uh, new patients. Medicare it was it had to be in the same facilities and in a rural area, um, and that rural area was not what you determined. But there they had specific sites on a map. And again, if that patient drove outside that area, he was then not in in a rural area anymore. So those those regulations, I think, prevented a, a lot of new patient relationships, and it was harder. Um, but it it could be done depending on the state. Thank you, thank you. Um, some of the questions I'm getting is about about um, you know which platforms or which devices, uh, maybe platforms. Uh, uh, maybe Dick could uh, answer. You know, what what are the platforms out there, and what what do you prefer, or what do you suggest? Um, um, but yeah, I didn't specifically mention anything in the presentation because I think, you know, it's proprietary. Can I mean not proprietary, but it, I 
because of the CME, nobody wanted me to talk about it. So I, which I didn't want to do anyway. But um, so I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to. I'll, I'll just mention the, the the things that we know about. You know, when when med when CMS uh, uh, opened up the the process, they um, basically allowed any um, any platform, with the exception of some community platforms like. Facebook Live and uh, Google Hangout, or not Google Hangout, there was another one. I can't remember. Just some things that I can't even, I don't remember what they, I don't, I, I didn't recognize them. But but the things that there are available, you can use FaceTime right now and you can use Zoom. I mean, you can use, uh, uh, so you can use FaceTime and you can use uh, Skype. But those two are not HIPAA compliant, as I pointed out in, in, in my, and I think. Mark's right. Right now, things are it's kind of wide open right now, but I think they're going to pull that back at some point. Either they're, you're going to have to have some protection for patient privacy at some point. So the ones that are available that are that that I know of um, that we've used uh, off and on, we have one that we use predominantly um, <clears throat> because of our the way we got started. Um, uh, but uh, Teladoc is one of those. Teladoc has the advantage of having a built-in electronic health record and, you know, all of the bells and whistles. I don't think you need that. I mean, we didn't need, feel like we needed that in a primary care practice. And it, a lot of the stuff was unnecessary. And there's a lot of, I mean, it's the one that we, we use it a lot. And the other ones, the Zoom for Health, it's a, it's a subscription um, of, I think, a couple hundred bucks a year. But it is HIPAA compliant, and it does have pretty good uh, ease of use. Um, the other one that we are just starting to use that's free is something called Doxy.me, and it's a very simple program. Um, patients, you can just send them a link; they can click on the link and get into the visit, and it's very easy to use. I'm not saying that one is better; they all have their different advantages, but those are the ones that I'm aware of. Mark? Um, yeah, and I think that so, so Skype actually has, Skype business is is HIPAA compliant, actually. Um, okay. And there are, like, so I I personally use VC, um, which is a low bandwidth, is, is why I've always chosen it more than anything else, because I think there's, there's a lot of options out there, and as you begin to look at them, um, I think that especially even right now, people are rapidly trying to make, I mean, I know uh, Doximity just came out with one right now to, to kind of capture a lot of this stuff, part of their free dialer. Um, it's only for iPhones. I think they go through kind of the, the piggyback on, on FaceTime. The, the key is you need to be able to get a BAA agreement with the provider. It's not necessarily that they're, they're secure or not, like, so for example, FaceTime is actually probably one of the most secure ones, but Apple refuses to sign a BAA with anyone. So even though FaceTime's secure, they'll never be HIPAA compliant because they're not willing to play by the rules. Their, um, Amazon's got one that's coming out. Um, so I think that you'll have a, a, a lot of different options, but I, what I would tell you to look for is each one of them goes through different technologies. Some use servers, rerouters, some use um, uh, different bandwidth uh, issues. So if you're at a hospital or in an area with low bandwidth or you have rural, a lot of rural people, sometimes they don't have a very strong internet signal. So a high bandwidth program can sometimes really be delayed, whereas a lower bandwidth program is easier to get through the, the traffic of the hospitals and things like that. Um, one of the companies I work for actually provides VR um, video as well. I mean, it takes five to 20 megabytes sometimes to do that uh, versus uh, uh, the one that I use, the platform I use is, you know, pennies on the dollar compared to that. So it, that's probably the biggest consideration and the quality of the video. EMR, a lot of them are integrated. And sometimes you can get, even if you go through Epic or NextGen, they will have a proprietary one that goes through their, they're different options, um, but I, I would tell you in general, I prefer to have them separate um, because if one goes down, you're not dealing with the web traffic on the other. So you could a lot of times you can have 
Um, the video backbone will stay up even though your EMRs crashed. Or if your EMRs crashed, you can switch to a phone and you still have all the information you need. So that's why I keep them separate. I would agree with that. And, uh, and uh, Mark, uh, uh, what are your recommendations for the uh, devices uh, to examine a patient? Do you have any favorites? What have you tried? How, how Not has your really. I would say I. I just tell my patients to go on, on, a lot of times I'm very particular. This is one of the few times I'm not. Um, I, I just tell them to download a USB device. Uh, like, and, and I say, it's a, if, you, if you Google Otoscope USB, you'll see a ton of options. And I say, if, if we give them, I just I tell them to look at the shipping date because sometimes if they're coming from China, it could be six weeks. So you want to make sure it's within the time for the visit. Um, but most of them are the same. They're HD quality, they're, they're cost. That way, again, I don't feel bad about telling a patient to buy something. It's, hey, just get one of these. I know that there are other at-home videoing and, and specifically designed for, for healthcare. They're a little bit more expensive. Um, I've not been doing long enough that I think that I care. The ones that have all gotten the ones at home have been very happy with it. Um, so I guess we are coming close to our time. One last question. Were there any challenges when it came to the billing situation and has that changed with COVID, you know, getting paid for the visit? You know, I'll just take a stab at it. Mark uh, may have a lot more detailed information, but I mean, clearly, yeah, at the beginning, if we wouldn't have been encouraged to use telehealth by our uh, one of our health plans came to us and offered us a subsidy to use the product uh, regardless of payer and um, we were able to pay basically the same level of payment that we to each other because of that subsidy we paid that uh, uh, going forward now that cms has uh, opened up the payment model dramatically i don't think you're going to face that same challenge there is a little bit of challenge. I mean, it's a, most of us have EMRs. Most of us have uh, webcams on our our on our uh, computers. I will say that it, uh, from our experience with our telehealth product, using an iPad um, or an iPhone was simplest for us and the most reliable for us. Um, we had some problems with our webcams for a while. But I'm using a webcam today, and it's it's been working fine. I did three visits this morning before the before the uh, uh, webinar today. So, yeah, you've got to make it sustainable. It's got to be it's got to work to to make it sustainable. And I think that's the challenge: is how do we transition? How do we pivot, as Mark said, to a, a to the new uh, reality? And I would agree pretty much with that. I would tell you that I've never had a problem getting paid when I followed the rules. Um, and, and I think that's the, the key here. The thing to take away from, from all of this, it's why it worked. I think for the, the campfire, it's why it worked for Katrina. It's why it worked for all these things is all of a sudden I can now provide better care through virtual visits than I can from real visits. Um, I'm putting less risk to my patients. I'm providing things without any of the, the regulation. It's easy to get paid. If, if regulation goes back into place, you'll still get paid just fine as long as you follow the rules. When I got paid, I got paid for the same, if not more so, because of the technology fee than before. It was just so onerous to separate which patients I did it with and not. It just wasn't worth my time. So I just did. I only did it for patients that were coming from out of state or, or couldn't travel for some reason. And a lot of times I did it at a loss. I just did it to, to make sure I provided the care to the patient. Now it's the same. Patients tend to prefer it. I mean, and also think about CMS and Medicare. Uh, it depends on your region, probably, but you know, for senior citizens at 70 years old on the road, it's more dangerous for them to drive to your clinic than to get on the phone. Um, I mean, my patients would say they only want to, they only want visits between, you know, uh, 10 o'clock and 11, so they don't have to deal with traffic, or two and three because they didn't want to get coming during rush hour. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times one of them backing out into the parking lot hit somebody. So for them, they would much rather stay at home. Um, 
and I think, or not drive, it's probably a better term, maybe not stay at home. But um, so I do think that it, it, there are advantages that Medicare will have a hard time going backward. And it was the biggest block. My, my private payers, a lot of them would pay because they could do it cheaper. I mean, the, the patients preferred it and it, it was something they could offer that nobody else had. Um, but the, the CMS, I think now that they're paying for it, I don't think it's, that part's going to be hard to go completely back to the way it was. Well, with that word, uh, we come to a close of our session. Uh, thank you, Mark Dean, uh, MD, and Richard Thorpe, MD, both uh, excellent practitioners of telemedicine. And uh, thank you all uh, to the listeners that watched this. Um, and we would love to get your feedback. And if you want to see more of more of uh, these seminars that we have done, go to vc.com slash webinars. And uh, this is the final webinar in our series. And you can view the recordings uh, from the past talks, you know, on a variety of subjects uh, surrounding telemedicine, including malpractice, reimbursement, etc. cetera. And uh, thank you, uh, Gary. Uh, do you have any final words for us? I think you're muted. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I wanted to thank you, Yuli, for hosting this webinar series. You've done a spectacular job. It's been incredibly informative and very practical for our private practice base who are having anxiety about jumping into telemedicine. And I'd like to thank Mark and uh, Dick for participating in this, which was the most practical of all the seminar series, which was the actual providers who've made the transition and who work with it day to day and can impart uh, that expertise on our uh, pract you know, practitioner base. So thank all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks for having us.